Uh, just continuing along with design tools and design capture, uh, just note that rarely is it necessary for a designer to worry about mass geometries and the actual layout itself. A sophisticated tool is usually available to automatically generate layouts for you. Uh, HDLs are extensively used for ASICs and uh, modules used within them. Uh, and You may see schematic capture used at some point and that's primarily containing connectivity information about a design and it's more likely to be seen at the printed circuit board level than at an IC level. So uh, just an overview, a little bit of uh, schematic capture, I'm sure you're familiar with it, but the designer basically enters a circuit description, places symbols on design, connects the ports with uh, uh, with wires, and uh, typically the symbols in a schematic would be a larger macro scale cell, perhaps uh, gates from a standard cell library, um, possibly low level transistors available in the technology. And, and again, it depends on the type of design you're doing. Maybe if you're doing some RF design, that might be more likely the case. Uh, functional units, uh, maybe larger ALUs or register banks. Uh, good for visualization, gives you a block diagram of the, the look of the hardware. And uh, that's basically true for, for structural HDL as well, uh, capturing how the, the elements are connected. So here's a simple example of, of an ALU slice. Uh, the only thing to maybe point out here is obviously it's tedious and, and prone to error if it gets complex. And that's, you know, a relatively uh, non-complex uh, slice there. Um, anyway, it does sort of illustrate some hierarchical design. You could build that slice and then replicate that many times, uh, create a you know an 8-bit ALU if you like. Um, and once you have the a schematic or HDL entered, basically you have connectivity information between components, and those are extracted by fire uh, by following the wire ports of the symbols. Now uh, this allows you to look for simple design errors, maybe unconnected nets could be detected at that step. Uh, the HDL or schematic capture also allows designers to extract an atlas without uh, creating a layout. So what that would allow you to do is a functional simulation of design during uh, the de uh, development cycle to make sure that your, your logic is functionally correct. Um, designs could then be extended to include perhaps generic delays to make sure that you're you know, meeting some timing uh, specifications or requirements and, and uh, then you could go to the point of placing and routing the design to maybe extract delay parameters which would be back annotated onto the schematic or your or your net list for a more detailed uh, simulation so that you, you might hear this terminology back annotated from layout and basically it's it's just getting a better idea what the delay might be associated with the blocks that you've put down so typically you're going to use a design database and ideally it would be use the operating system's file system um, without belaboring the point too much uh, this makes it look much like a, a modern IDE environment where your project is uh, managed by many of the utilities within the operating system itself. So some of the layout tools again, uh, programs for editing layouts are, are the backbone of low-level IC design. So even if HDLs and synthesis are used for design entry, a layout editor is still used somewhere along the way uh, before fabrication. It may have been that uh, someone used the layout editor to to build a cell library for that particular technology. Uh, there's many different tools out there, Synopsys, Mentor Graphics, Cadence, or mainstream vendors, and the large number of uh, smaller, even freeware type tools are available. But layout generally implies that you're drawing polygons. And those polygons represent different uh, layers of material on the surface of the, the wafer. So some of the layout representations, um, one of the most simple uh, means of representing a layout is, is through tiling. So an IC layout is represented as a set of planes. So each of the different uh, materials that's going to be deposited would represent a different plane. Maybe it's a via or a metal or a diffusion or polysilicon. Uh, each of these planes would be tiled. And uh, basically a list of tiles is maintained which covers the entire chip at that level. So in this particular case, you're not storing the image bit by bit or pixel information, but rather a representation of the geometry. And, and uh, here's an example of what it might look like if you're drawing a simple little uh, transistor and you're worrying about the different layers. So you'd have a polysilicon, a diffusion, and, b and then the formation of the device where these two cross. And clearly this is very low-level design and, and likely to uh, never likely to actually encounter it. Uh, corner stitching is just a, a computational geometry technique that allows basically the non-overlapping tiles to exist in a plane. And the nice thing about this is that uh, even though it may be a little bit more difficult for humans to work with, it does lend itself to efficient algorithms. And uh, those exist for, for example, finding neighboring geometries and other operations like plowing are made, uh, made possible a little bit more easily. And we'll look at some of those in a slide or two.
So there's a, an idea of what a geometry might look like if it's corner stitched, all those are different size rectangles, but they're all stitched together to cover the plane. Uh, from the designer's perspective, the internal representation of a layout geometry is not very important. What is important is to realize that this type of information is stored in a manner that allows for algorithms to efficiently manipulate the data. Here's an example of an early design tool that was called uh, Electric. Uh, we used it here in Canada and uh, that was back in the days when actually do some um, ASIC design through a foundry service provided by Nortel and it had some nice features associated with it. Uh, there's a nice little inter uh, a freeware version of it I think the, uh, still at the bottom here that I pointed out and a really good interview by Stephen Rubin who was the creator of Electric and sort of some of the rationalization for it and I'll just point out a couple of things which are interesting. Um, you would uh, be able to connect up uh, nodes and you'd be able to uh, uh, you know, stitch uh, these nodes together to form uh, various types of components, maybe a transistor, maybe something larger. But one of the nicest features of Electric was that it had a design rule checking on the fly. So you might have moved a, a polysilicon uh, piece over a little bit in the editor and uh, if it came too close and violated a design rule, perhaps to a, an adjacent piece of polysilicon that wasn't uh, on the same uh, net list, then um, it would uh, basically violate a design rule and you'd be notified that immediately and then you could back off your design a little bit. So it was sort of much like using a spell checker in Word and that was certainly a nice innovation of that early design uh, design rule checking on the fly uh, within Electric. In the States they used a tool called Magic and it was developed again as a university type tool to allow people to build uh, integrated circuits typically from a cell library. Uh, it had a few things uh, associated with it which were interesting and one of them would have been the incremental design rule checker not quite as sophisticated as one within electric and the other was a channel router so uh, within electric you had to route everything by hand within magic you had a channel router so basically you just enter the connectivity information in a file and then mag uh, magic would connect up the design once the cells are placed and it used the variation of simulated annealing which we'll talk about in, in a few uh, slides as well so here's a simple example of plowing and the type of problems that basically fall into the realm of computational geometry. Now this perhaps is what the layout looked like initially and had a certain area associated with it. If you're able to, to move this, let's say it's a metal wire in and basically shift these over to compensate for it, you'd end up building something which had a slightly less area. So that uh, hopefully illustrates at least something along the lines of computational geometry and the type of, of things that you'd have to do to, to move something over without violating any design rules such as spacings. Uh, Cadence is a commercial tool. It's an industrial strength commercial uh, suite of tools rather. It offers a wide range of IC design tools based on a relatively common platform, place and route, simulation, modeling, synthesis, design rule checking, and more recently uh, design verification type tools. It's certainly a very expensive type of tool and at one point in time I think it actually came with an engineer. Uh, so Cadence doesn't supply source code for their system but you can interact with it with a built-in programming language called Skill which is very similar to Lisp and uh, basically the attributes of being able to manage data and data structures very well. So again this was built uh, basically for for the uh, efficiency of algorithms as opposed to the, the people interacting with it. So it's not a, a single program, but rather a collection of tools, and I mentioned a couple already at Place and Route, although we haven't talked too much about that. You can imagine that placement means placing different components and routing them as basically connecting those up. And uh, this basically is an automated uh, layout synthesis from a schematic or HDL. Um, the trend anyway is toward building IC systems from hardware C, system C, system Verilog, MATLAB, uh, very basically very high level representations of uh, your design. So some of the design tools within uh, Cadence would be symbolic layout, compaction, and we'll take a look at compaction in a bit. Design rule checking, we haven't looked at in any great detail, but you can uh, imagine that it's making sure that you're perhaps not putting two metal wires too close together, so you'd violate design rule, circuit extraction, analog tools, and I've listed a couple there. Monolithic microwave tools, basically RF, uh, module generation, and MEMS. And as I said, verification and test tools as well as more. Um, anyway, for small specialized design, a uh, designer may wish to lay out the, last ma lay out the masks manually, but it's highly unlikely. Uh, for larger uh, designs, much of the work can be automated with various tools, and uh, this basically reduces design time, and design automation tools are less prone to errors than, than human designers. 
Now there may be some exceptions to that rule and we'll look at one a little bit later where where basically Apple said they had one of their more recent chips, uh, a large part of it designed by by uh, hand crafting at the at the layout level to, to meet their specifications. Uh, but anyway, layout generation tools are probably not as good at design as human experts or hand crafting a design, but design time is significantly reduced at the expense of uh, size and speed. Um, so here we'll just take a look at a simple example of a compaction tool, and it's just used to, to compact the layout. Uh, compaction not only increases circuit density if you're packing them in tighter, but that has the uh, effect of reducing parasitic uh, capacitances, for example. And if you recall the power equation, you see that that would be a good thing to do if you're trying to reduce the amount of power that the chip is dissipating. So although, although compaction could be uh, performed on an entire layout, the complexity of the problem usually limits it to compaction of small cells. So you, you make uh, uh, all your cells uh, as compact as possible, again hoping that the overall design will be as compact as possible. And that's basically the uh, a design rule, if you like, of, of or paradigm of a divide and conquer, and that's seen in action in that case. So compaction tools are used extensively with cell generation uh, programs and synthesis of layouts. So the cell generation would be uh, tools that allow you to build cells. Um, those would be used within a standard cell environment and then you'd build your design from those and synthesize a complete layout. So these tools tend to, to create layouts that are functional but not necessarily optimally compact but but they're likely to be less uh, have less errors in them than if you did them by hand. Here's an example of a one-dimensional compaction, certainly not used anywhere because it's not very sophisticated, but the layout is compacted first in the x-direction and then the layout is compacted in the y-direction and that is repeated as much as you can uh, until you can't, uh, uh, you know, gain any more uh, uh, increases in, in, uh, in, in area. So it's a greedy type of algorithm and it often gets stuck at something which is less than an optimal solution. So here's an example, here's the initial layout, it's just plop down transistors, it does the compaction in the x-direction first, so it squeezes them together as close as possible without desi violating design rules, such as these two gate materials have to be this far apart. And then it tries to compact them in the y-direction, so this pushes this down and maybe it's going to make it a little bit smaller in, 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 uh, in, in overall area. So this would be the, the final layout, perhaps, or you know, after, after you've compacted in the X and Y direction, this is what you get, and perhaps as a final layout, you might do something like this, where you basically jog the design a little bit and squish it in a little tighter. This wouldn't be very obvious from one-dimensional compaction. Basically, use more sophisticated type of algorithms, such as simulated annealing or something, which, which allows you to uh, basically relax the constraint on the design, maybe move it over, maybe gain in, uh, in area. So it's a non-obvious step, and typically uses some type of heuristic within the algorithms to accomplish that. And that sort of brings us to two-dimensional compaction, where you try to compact in both the x and y direction simultaneously. It's a much more computationally difficult task and general, generally requires some heuristics or some AI-type algorithms. So we'll briefly look at a couple of these non-deterministic algorithms, simulated annealing being the, the most important of these, but there's a couple more that, more that we may, may mention uh, as we go through this section.